spat, and seemed sad, said nothing. The monk unfolded his token, to show it to them. And it was then, if he had had any doubt before, that he knew for certain that he was dreaming, for he could read the characters on the paper he carried. They were simple characters, so simple he thought it a wonder he had not been able to read them before, and they described one who shaped, who moulded and formed things from chaos and from nothing, who transmuted things from formlessness and shapelessness into that which was not real, but without which the real would have no meaning. The second man sneezed to attract the monk's attention, and then he pointed, almost as if accidentally, to a specific hill. The monk bowed his thanks and walked toward the hill. Looking back as he reached the hill, he saw that the fat man was now floating, face down in the fish pond, and his murderer was looking down at him from the balcony of his house. When he was halfway up the hill, he looked back one more time, and saw that the house had gone, and the men, and the pool, and where it had been there was nothing more than a graveyard. Ahead of him was a huge house, built to be perfectly one with its surroundings, for it was at once a shrine and a castle and a home. It was a place of waterfalls and gardens, of painted screens and elegant curving roofs. He could not tell if it was one house or a hundred houses. He saw courtyards and orchards and trees, spring blossoms and autumn leaves and summer fruit all grew beside each other on the trees of the strange garden. Bright birds sang from those trees. They were of blues and reds, so vivid that they seemed like flying flowers, and the songs they sang were passing strange. The monk had never seen a place like it. There was a carved gate, made of golden 